from tonight's guest speaker is Matt Aldridge from Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, Matt, I know I have the information here. Yes. Okay. Matt is um, a Colorado native, though he moved around the country a bit for his education. He received a PhD in biomathematics from North Carolina State University. He's worked for Colorado Parks and Wildlife since 2006, primarily focusing research efforts on large carnivores, specifically mountain lions and black bears. He's a passionate about wildlife and research and strives to provide information to help manage wildlife in an ever-changing environment. If that was an insufficient introduction, Matt, I would welcome you to supplement that. And um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Matt Aldridge. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'll try to make the microphone work or used to just shouting out to a room. So um, feel free to interrupt at any time. I love to take questions in the middle of things. Um, I think it's a great way to interact. If you're on Zoom and text something in, I guess Andrew's going to have to cut me off and, and jump in for questions. Um, so um, that's a lot of talk about birds. I only work with things that weigh over 30 pounds because then I only have to memorize what less than 10 things in the state. So it's really easy. <laughs> No, actually, my PhD was on birds. Um, I did a bunch of mathematical models, statistical modeling of point counts and how to do point counts better to get better estimates. And then I spent my entire postdoc proving that every technique people use to do point counts is wrong and totally biased. So, um, so then I came here and worked for uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, actually grew up in Fort Collins, so um, it was good to get back here from the east. Um, I really just need to be around the mountains. So um, this is home to me. I've been studying mountain lions since 2006 and black bears, um, throwing in some elk research and some deer research and various research projects. Um, for those of you that don't know the way the Colorado Parks and Wildlife structure is, um, we've got biologists, we've got our law enforcement, and then we've got biologists who are doing a lot of the season stuff management, direct management, things like that. And then we have small research groups I think there's six of, a, of us that do mammals research. There's four or five uh, avian researchers and then some aquatic researchers. And we get involved when there's a lack of information. People are asking questions and, and there's not really answers out there. So then we start these research projects. Um, I was actually hired to study mountain lions and human interactions. So I'm going to focus a lot on that. Um, because that was a big issue, um, has been an, a growing issue for a lot of years and, and is one that's not going away. Um, you want to change slides for me? Perfect. Um, who has actually seen a mountain lion? Cool. When I used to, years ago, 15 years ago when I did this talk, there were fewer and fewer people that actually would raise their hand. Um, now, if I go to places like Boulder and ask that question, everybody in the room, I think it's all ringing doorbells. But um, so, who has seen a puma? The same hand should go up, right? So, okay, okay. Just check. Not everybody knows that. Who's seen a cougar? Okay, same hands, right? Um, it's a, it's yeah, catamount, panther, painter. They got a lot of names, um, and I, I've. I've worked in Wyoming for a bit. I worked in Idaho a bit. Um, so it depends on where you go. If I was in Idaho, I would not be saying mountain lion. I'd be saying cougar up there. Everybody knows them as cougars. And if I walked in a room and started talking about mountain lions, what are you talking about? Um, so um, I do pay attention to that a little bit on where I'm at. Um, so mountain lion is kind of a weird name. Does anybody know where that came from? So when European settlers came over, they had heard of lions, right? And then they saw this lion, this large cat. It was one color, it was tawny color. And I'm like, oh, it's a lion. Well, they had heard of the African lion. And so it was kind of misnamed in that way. Um, so, and it just stopped. 
and mountain lion has a lot of connotations that they're in the mountains, right? No, no. Not always, this guy's on top of it up here. Um, so believe it or not, if we exclude humans, mountain lions have the broadest geographic distribution of any mammal in North America. So they've all the way up into Canada, coast to coast, Pacific to the Atlantic, all the way through uh, Central America and all the way through South America. Um, so huge, huge just distribution there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Anybody read the Red Fern Groves? Come on, everybody's read it. What do they call the mountain lion in that book? I can give you a page number. No, I can't. What book? The Red Fern Groves. The Red Fern Groves. They called the lion, wasn't a good name, the devil cat, right? So all of our historic literature that we grew up with didn't really have a real positive light on lions. They were pretty negative about them. And so lions were extirpated from a lot of North America. Um, they were bounty, they were shot on sight, they were poisoned and whatnot because people were afraid of them. Anybody afraid of lions in here? You're not gonna hike out in the woods if you know lions around in the middle of the night? Like a little bit. Yeah. Um, so people were afraid of them. And they also interfered with people's way of life, livestock. They were killing a lot of livestock. So being who we are, we wiped them out. So by the 1950s, 1960s, they really weren't found east of the Rockies. There was the, the Puna or Panther in Florida, but other than that, they were pretty much gone. Um, next slide, please. Um, let's talk about lion habitat a little bit. Um, I just said they were from coast to coast. This is kind of where you would think of them now, any rocky outcroppings, forested areas. Um, but what I would like to say is if there's deer, you can have lions. It's pretty simple. And we see that with these lion populations that are starting to move back towards the east. They're going in these riparian bottoms where there's a lot of white tip deer, things like that. Um, so lions can be anywhere, um, but this is the typical lion habitat that you would see lions in in Colorado, these, these rocky areas, these bluffs, canyons, deep canyons, um, forested areas. Um, next slide, please. So we talked about this management history. Colorado was one of the first states to actually start managing mountain lions. In 1965, Colorado, along with um, Nevada, um, started protecting lions. We started manage, managing them as an agency. And by 1973, all of the Western states had jumped on board and were managing lions. So we didn't over harvest them to protect them as a species. That management included hunting. We've hunted lions since 1965 when we started managing. So to this day, mountain lions are hunted in Colorado. Um, I think it's an important part of management. Um, and we'll get into that more in a little bit. But that's kind of the history of lions. Since that time, we've seen these lion populations across the West. Um, expand. So historically, lions were extir extirpated out of the Dakotas. Since we started managing lions, there's now a really big thriving lion population in the Dakotas. We've got lions back in Nebraska. We've got lions in Missouri. So these lion populations are spreading back east. And everybody remembers the lion that went to Connecticut, right? It was in the newspaper. Um, oh, it was it was like national news. It was it was crazy. Um, so it must have been like ten years ago, maybe even more. I don't know. Days are running together. Um, that there was a mountain lion that was. It actually ended up getting hit by a car in Connecticut, but they tracked it from the Dakota population, and they got samples in it from uh, of it in Wisconsin and Minnesota. As it went east, so they, you know, there were sightings, and they got genetic samples and matched it up to the North Dakota population, and it just kept going. Why would it keep going? It's looking for another lion, right? It started going east, and it's like, oh, this is cool. Why aren't there any other lions? And you know, it would be deer along the way, and it would look around and not find any other lions, and it would keep moving, and finally ended up in. in Connecticut. So lions are pretty good at moving. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
One thing about working with a state agency is it's really easy for people to find your email. I get a lot of pictures on Monday morning. <laughs> Not all like this. Most of the pictures I get are piles of scat. <laughs> it's great for a Monday morning. They're like, is this a lion? Was it a lion? Like that. No. Um, sometimes, yes. Um, and then I get a lot of pictures that, from people that are out hiking and they run into these big tracks and they think it's a lion. Um, and, and so here's the difference between a dog and a lion. The most obvious one, toenails, right? Just like your house cat, they keep their claws retracted. Um, you can see that on the lion there, cougar. I use cougar when I write because I'm lazy and it's really easy, faster for me to type cougar <laughs> than mine. Um, so you can see on the right side there the, the lion tracks those two front um, digits, they're kind of, they're not parallel to each other. They sit off at, at different angles. Uh, you can also, if you work at it, almost draw an X through the pads on the toe and not hit the heel pad versus a dog. You can't do that. You always run across. So those are some of the easiest differences. Next slide, please. If you see tracks in the snow, I still struggle with this. I see tracks in the snow and I get all excited that there's a lion track. Um, and I always have to check it out. But when it really is a lion track, I have no doubt in my mind it's a lion track. It's just one of those things that you know when you see it, but you have to go check every track. Um, so here we have the female, right? Yeah. I think it's a female. So females are a little bit smaller than males. So what I found is that if I can step between the tracks and the heel of my boot goes to, and the, the heel of my boot on the end of one to the toe of my boot on the next one, about 12 inches apart, that's usually a female. If there's about four inches of space in between, now we're talking an adult male. Um, this that stride's just enough longer. And that's pretty consistent walking on the black ground. Um, so that's a female. But there is a size difference too. Uh, next slide, please. And then there's these little buggers. They're pretty cute. They actually come out spotted. Little blue eyes. Um, so uh, a, fe a female will have anywhere between one and four kittens, um, sometimes five. Usually the average is two and a half that they'll actually have. Um, you know what time of year they breed or have kittens? All year long. Any time of the year. Yeah. yeah. They're eating, have consistent diet all year long. There's no really real pulse like deer. You know, they have that spring green up. That's the time to actually have have fawns if you're a deer. But here you're just eating deer all year long. So there's not really a good time. So if a if a female were to lose her kitten, she'd go back into estrus right away and have kittens again. Um, next slide, please. And we've got to talk about what lions eat. Anybody know how big a lion is? How big? Any guesses on how big a mountain lion would be? 80 pounds. 80 pounds? 120 on a female? Male 120? Any other guesses? Um, 80 is pretty close on female. Um, when I was around here in the Boulder um, area, I was getting females right around 100 pounds. Um, I'm doing a study now farther south, and the females are coming in a little bit lighter, 90, 95 pounds. Um, males, an average average adult male, 150, 160. Uh, the biggest one I've ever handled was 185 pounds. Um, anybody know how big a deer is? Bigger than bigger than the lion, right? These are amazing animals. So you've got a hundred pound female lion that can kill a full grown deer, a doe, a buck, an elk, bull elk, bull moose. So we're talking a hundred pound animal that can kill something that's eight times their size. They're absolutely amazing predators. So a lot of times what we see is they're out there and they kind of spot and stop. 
So they'll get to where they can see and they'll actually find something that might be dinner for them. And then they'll kind of sneak up close and then they'll wait for dinner to walk in front of them. And then they'll lunge on out, out after it. And they usually just crush the throat. So they grab them underneath by the throat and just hold on. There's a lot of videos out there anymore about lions uh, you know, killing a deer. And you can see they're just holding on. Um, once they kill something, they'll drag it to a good spot. It's amazing to see what a lion can do. I used to think I was pretty strong and we would actually be trying to catch lions and we'd put deer out for bait. Has anybody ever tried to drag a full deer? <laughs> it's exhausting. You can't do it, you lose your grip. I've literally put these baits out that have taken two guys to set out. And then that night a lion comes in, you know, 100 pound female lion comes in and you can't even see where this deer went, it's just gone. And they'll literally grab it and sometimes just throw it over the back and walk out with it. Straight up hills, like, how do you do that? Um, anyway, they'll make a cache like this. Part of that is to keep uh, stamina away from it because they put a lot of effort into making a kill. And so they don't want to lose it to, to scavengers. So they'll cover it up and then they'll come back on it and feed on a deer like this every, you know, throughout the night. They bed close by and then they'll move on. Next slide, please. So deer are their primary prey, but they will eat other things. They'll eat almost anything that comes in front of them. So they'll eat rabbits, skunks. Next slide, please. Porcupines. Porcupines are fun. Has anybody seen a porcupine lately? No. When I, in 2006, when we started this study, I would find porcupines that lions have killed. I haven't seen one in forever. We put trail cameras out all over the place. Some of my coworkers put trail cameras out. Like, we're covering the state. We don't see porcupines anymore. I don't know what happened to them. But the sub adults love to kill porcupines. And then they roll in the quills. And then when I catch them, I, yeah, it's really fun. Um, it's like, so this is kind of how they, how they go about it. You know, this lion will try to come up and get that deer by the by the throat. Next slide, please. Um, and this is this is the end when they get them by the throat, and they'll just suffocate them. Um, unlike a bear that's a little bit stronger. Next slide, please. Um, survival. Everybody wants to know about survival. Uh, kittens have about 70, 75 percent survival rate, so pretty high. Um, a lot of the deer studies we're doing have much, much lower survival rates. Elk studies um, where we're down 30%, something like that. Um, so lion, like kittens, do pretty well. It's the sub-adults that die more, more than anything else. A lot of that is conflict with other lions where they're trying to fit in, um, getting into trouble, um, getting killed, trying to figure out how to eat things. Um, you know, I just mentioned that they're killing deer and elk. That is a, a big source of mortality when you're trying to suffocate something and they're kicking you. And we, we find a lot of lions that die that way. Um, adult female, 75 to 80% survival, and the adult male is 85 to 90% survival. So their survival is pretty high. Um, we think of lions a lot as territory. And as we put GPS collars on lions, we've realized that they're not quite as territorial as we thought. Um, adult males will have territories, but they'll overlap with the other, other adult male. I've actually found an adult male on an elk kill, and that adult male left, and the next night, a different adult male was on that same kill. So they do overlap a bit. Females overlap a lot, um, usually related females. So a lot of times, um, the, the mother will have their offspring, the offspring dispersed. A lot of times, some of those female offsprings, the daughters will stay in that area. Um, and set up a home range. So the females overlap a lot, and then the males do have a, a weak territory overlapping with a, a bunch of females. Next slide, please. So this is basically what you think of as a territory, the red being the male, and then female territories within it. Um, female territories that we've measured are about 100 square kilometers versus the male territories anywhere from 500 to, eight to 800 square kilometers. So they cover a lot of country. Um, really huge areas. Next slide, please. Um, at about 14 to 18 months is when the young disperse, so they stay with their mother a long time. Um, every now and then, you'll see in the papers pictures that have um, pictures in the paper where there's like six or seven lions together. Um, usually, that would be like mother and their full-grown kittens. Um, 
or mother and offspring or two sibling females and their offspring making this these larger groups of lions. Um, when you get an 18 month old 18 month old kitten still hanging out with mom, it looks like a bunch of big lions because by then the males are bigger than the female um, and you know the female kitten's just as big as her. Um, males typically will disperse 100, 200 kilometers just to get out of that area away from where they were born. Uh, females don't disperse nearly as much. Next slide, please. So that's kind of the basics of lions. Now I'm gonna go over some of the research highlights that we've had here. Um, next slide, please. So I, I wanna to return to this idea of, we started managing in 1965. And if you talk to some people that have lived on farms and ranches in the mountains, they would tell you that until about 2000, they never saw a lion. And so there's, there's a couple things going on here with this human interaction. We started managing lions and these populations started expanding. They started coming back into historic habitats like the front range of Colorado. You know, in the 1960s, there weren't that many lions here. And now those populations were really coming back. In fact, the population estimate I got out of Boulder was one of the highest lion densities ever recorded. So they're doing really well in these areas. Um, at the same time, these lion populations are coming back. We're all moving there too. So we've got the expanding human population, expanding lion population. And now I have a job because I can study lion human interactions. Perfect. Um, so that's why I wanted to revisit that. Um, during the Front Range study, that study was essentially lions, Highway 36, all the way through Evergreen. We were studying lions, um, trying to get lions that were actually coming into city limits and, and catching those to see what they're doing, <laughs> which group of lions it is, you know, is it the trouble cleaning the lion? Because um, some of the people are saying, you know, it's the subadult males that are coming in and causing problems. So we wanted to get a handle on if there's a specific demographic that's coming in, when they're coming in, what they're doing when they come in, um, are they habituated to people or not. Um, so during that study, we caught 102 independent cougars, uh, back to cougars, lions. Actually, when I type, I type cat. And then when I'm done, I do a word search and replace it all. <laughs> I get lazy. Um, a lot of those lions we caught multiple times, uh, 50 females, 52 males, and we were marking cubs for a while. Um, after, after a little bit, we decided we'd just go put trail cameras on all the kills to monitor cub survival that way. Um, it was much easier. Next slide, please. Mortalities. Um, a lot of it's human caused. Not a lot of hunting in the front range just because it's hard to hunt lions because there's too much private property. And the best way to hunt lions is with dogs. And if there's that much private property, you can't go on a hound chase and not go on to somebody else's property. So hunting is not a huge factor, but there's a lot of human interaction um, where lions are killing livestock and they might be put down for that. Lions are too close to schools, whatnot. Um, there's a lot of different cases like that. The one that surprised me any study student surprises with him? Roadkill is a little shocking, isn't it? No, you don't ever see lions and that you have to get hit on the road. We actually talked to a guy that drove the train down there between Boulder and Golden, and he said they actually hit a couple of lions every year on, with the train. Um, so it got me to thinking, why? And we do a lot of cage trapping too, where we'll catch them in a cage, and I always monitor that all night long. And then we're out in the middle of the night working up a lion with headlamps on. And then we can reverse the drug and let them go. So we're always standing there watching these lions walk away. And for some reason, my technicians like to keep their lights on when the lion wakes up and walks away. I don't know why. I like to turn mine on in the dark so I can't see anything. Um, what I started to notice is if we all turned our lights off, the lions would just line out and go straight away from us. But when everybody had their headlamps on, these lions would start walking in circles. And, and so what I think it is, is night blindness. So I think if a lion's got a deer or something near the road or happens to be near a road and the car's coming or the train's coming, that that light is, it's worse than what deer end up having night blindness 
and they just don't know where they are and they get lost and they get hit. Um, so that was, was surprising. Uh, we have these seven hunting mortalities. Um, I think three of those were actually out of the state. Um, most of those were out of our study area. Um, six unknown, four interspecific causes. So that's when one lion kills another lion. Um, we thought that would be adult males killing subadult males as the subadults trying to form a territory. That happened once, which is this picture. Um, but what it typically was, was an adult male killing a female. So the female would actually kill a deer and the adult male would come in and sometimes female would actually share that. Other times she had, didn't want anything to do with it and she would try to defend it and get killed in the process. Um, and in our current study, we're finding that happens quite a bit. Um, so that one was a little shocking to me. And then these four natural causes, um, in this study, that was actually um, a lion getting internal injuries when they're trying to kill an elk or deer and just get peritonitis and end up dying from that. Dispersal. So let's just talk about this real quick. We mentioned a cat. Just hit that button twice. If you would. The cat that went to Connecticut, but we actually had that orange line, um, a cat that was caught down by Evergreen. And one, the spring, he was a young subadult. And in April, that cat took off and decided to go to Wyoming, um, just follow the ridges. I mean, they're, they're traveling north south because that's where ridges go. I thought it was actually going to go to Nebraska. So that was going to be cool. But it didn't. It went up by Douglas, Casper, Wyoming, settled up there, was killed by a hunter. The same year that lion was killed by a hunter, we have that yellow track that another subadult male that left Boulder went up there, same spot, settled in the same area, ended up being killed by a hunter. We have this green one on the right here um, that we put a collar on. It really wasn't out in the plains when we collared it. It was, it was up by Estes when we collared it. Um, decided Kansas would be a cool place to visit. So went out to Kansas, headed south through Kansas, jumped back into Colorado to visit Lamar. So if you haven't been to Lamar, apparently it's a hot spot. Uh, ducked into Oklahoma and Texas and settled in New Mexico. Was there for a couple of years and then was shot by a hunter. Uh, they can move, they'll get up and move. Um, next slide, please. We actually had two lions that went to Pueblo um, once. That was a pretty remarkable movement. Uh, so some adult female and an adult female, um, both by Boulder. And it's weird that an adult female will move. We see a lot of the sub adult females, they go on these big loops and end up coming back. So they'll go hundreds, if not thousands of kilometers in this big loop and come back to where they were going. But this adult female and some adult female took off on literally the same day and they paralleled the tracks about 10 kilometers apart all the way to Pueblo. Honestly, they turned around and came back on the same day. I don't know how they did it, but it was pretty remarkable to watch. Um, why they were doing that, I was on looking at GPS locations every morning because it was pretty remarkable. Um, the adult female made it back to her home range and never left again. I don't know why. Yeah. When you're tracking them on GPS, do you get a continuous reading or do you just get blips on a Please team? repeat the question. Yeah. So the question was if, if when we're tracking on GPS, is it blips or is it is it continuous? Um, we get uh, on this study, we were doing seven to eight locations per day. So we figured out when we wanted the locations based on line activity, and we'd get those locations um, during the day. And then those would actually get emailed to me so I could sit there in my office. And, and see where lions are. Yeah. All of these are specific to my colleagues and all of these now are from that 102. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how many years were they calling? 2006 to 2016. So 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you can hit the video on there. The, one of the questions we wanted to ask were uh, was uh, do lions use urban areas? Mm -hmm. Um, ring doorbell wasn't out when I started my study. I could have wrapped this study up in about three months, right? I'd just give everybody a ring doorbell, save the state a bunch of money. We're done. Yes. Um, so now we know, because we see this on the news constantly, of videos from ring doorbells of these lions walking through the area. 
Um, with our GPS collars and the 102 lines that we mark, we put close to a million points on this map. And we can see these lions moving. And here is just a bunch of home ranges um, that you can see overlap. Um, but you see a lot of lions that avoid it too. Um, next slide, please. Uh, video at the bottom. Just run your mouse down a little bit. Uh oh. Um, so, with all of what, what we did, did anybody have any guesses on? Is it males or females that use urban areas? Sorry. Males? I hear some females. Females. Males tend to avoid it. Females tend to use it. We found, oh yeah, go ahead and click it. Oh. Did it skip? Yeah, it skipped over. Try again. There we go. This is the what we found in terms of how they use it. So you can see these dots going back out of town during the day, and then as it gets dark, these dots will come back in. Um, so they're still avoiding people in time. So when the city gets quiet, they're coming in. Um, and then um, during the day when they get active, they go back out. I started keying in on this when we were trapping lions, because some of these areas um, people's yards and stuff, we couldn't trap, or uh, we couldn't run hounds, and some of the open spaces, we couldn't run hounds, so we would use cages. And when we'd find a deer that was killed by a lion and trap out on an open space, as soon as the sun went down, I knew the lion was going in the trap, it was great. And then I would trap in these neighborhoods where they killed a deer in a neighborhood, and it was two o'clock in the morning before the lion. And so we started looking at these movements, and those lions would come in at night, Kill, make a kill, and then they'll go back out during the day. Um, so they are still trying to avoid human activity as much as possible. Um, I think why females are using these areas are for prey resources. Um, it is so hard on a female when they're lactating and trying to raise kittens, and their energetic demands triple. And so they're using these reliable food resources so that um, they can raise offspring. Whereas males can go out and avoid people like they want to and don't have to worry about food as much. Because um, if anybody's been to Boulder, that grocery store is always stocked, right? Mm -hmm. You drive through the west side of Boulder, you can always see deer in the neighborhood. They're like as common as people walking down the oh, sidewalks. Yeah. Got all of the lap dogs that they there's, out of there's dogs, there's raccoons, there's all these alternative prairie resources. So it's a great place. If you need food reliably, let's go to that grocery store and not go out in the woods where you have to work a little bit harder. Next slide, please. So we looked at predator-prey interactions. Next slide. Um, so GPS collars were really cool because like I said, I get emails on these locations. So every morning I could go into my office and I could look and see if a, if a group of points clustered up. So they were close together in time and space then I could go investigate and see what was going on in that area. We actually put um, a grad, uh, grad student through school on this project, and this is what he came up with in terms of diet. Um, most of the literature would suggest that uh, the lion will eat about one deer a week, so 52 deer a year. Um, we came up with 84, a um, little bit more than that, but that was the timing. So they would eat about 26 adult deer a year, and then they would key in on those fawns. Um, especially the zero to two month old fawns. As the fawns got a little bit bigger, they would start going back to the does. Um, a few elk and then 21% non-owned units. Uh, this was one of the biggest non-owned unit um, percentages that anybody had ever found in lion diets. Of course, not many people study lions in urban areas either. Um, so we dug into that one quite a bit too. Next slide, please. So let's look at this small prey. So if we look at this across a year, and this was several, several years worth of data just condensed into one calendar, um, we see they're eating, the proportion of small prey items is really low, January and February and December, both sides of the graph, and then it peaks there in June. Who can tell me why? They don't hibernate. 
Okay, small prey might be gone. Any other thoughts? They could be having babies, but they have babies on your own. You're brilliant. You're hired. <laughs> um, so there's a lot to what she just said. She suggested that that's when the fawns are, are, are being born, and that's when they're keying in on it. But why? Why would you do that? If you can kill a full-grown deer, and that's what you do most of the year, why would you switch? Less risk to the cat. Less risk to the cat getting injured? Yeah. Especially the mother. That's energy burn. Maybe, maybe. I had another idea. So it, it seems like in April is when that starts going up and May, and then it goes back down in October. Somebody said hibernation down here, but I think it's bears. When the bears come out of the den and they start scavenging off a lion's kill and taking it away from them, all of a sudden, like you were saying, it's no longer energetically wise to kill that deer and they lose it the next day to a bear. Just a theory. Um, but it seemed to correlate pretty well here. So just, just an idea there. Next slide, please, or just click that once. So you mentioned fawns. So this is what we see on non-ungulate and ungulate small prey items. You see that use of non-ungulates is going up there May and uh, April and May. There's no fawns on the ground yet. As soon as those fawns hit the ground, they're not using other small prey. They're using fawns almost exclusively for the next two months. Um, so, yeah, dead on the bottom. Next slide, please. Uh, where are they preying on these non ungulate small prey items? Um, generally, 57% of the non ungulate prey was within zero to 200 meters of human structures. So, somebody already mentioned, you know, there's lots of prey, smaller prey around these uh, urban areas. As you start moving out, less and less. By the time you're over 700 meters, most of their prey is going to be on the ungulates again. Uh, so next slide, please. So now we did some interesting graphs, and we looked at how housing density affects this. Um, the blue dots on all these slides are deer. So we'll go through those first. On that top slide, if it's above the red line, that's mean, that means they like it. They select for it. If it's below the red line, they're selecting against it. So that top graph is looking at male and female lions and the blue is deer. So both males and females like deer. Huh, that was cool. Um, let's look at age class. If you're young or old or anywhere in between, you like deer. Look at, look at month, time of the year. Every month of the year, you like deer. We're learning a lot now. Um, no matter how long it's been since you've had a meal. So this bottom right graph is pretty cool. If you had a meal yesterday, you still like deer. If you had a meal seven days ago or 10 days ago, you still like deer. All right, lions like deer. We learned nothing. Now look, let's look at housing density. And this gets back to a few of the things we've already touched on. You see here that both males and females select against housing density, but the selection against it is much stronger for males. So males are avoiding these uh, areas with higher housing density more than females are. Um, we can look at age class. Age class is a little misleading. You see that all lions avoid it, but those older age classes are avoiding it more. Did they learn to avoid it and decided that's not a good place to be? Or by that time, they're just not alive anymore because they did get into a conflict and were removed for human conflict. So that one's hard to interpret. Um, the next one, um, month six and seven, is when lions are avoiding human density. Why is that? Fawns. All the deer leave town to go have their fawns, so the lions leave town too. And then this last one, to me, was pretty fascinating. If I had a meal yesterday, I'm going to avoid town. If I had a meal two days ago, I'm still going to avoid town. But if I haven't eaten in a while, I'm going to go to town. So that one, that one was pretty interesting. Next slide, please. 
Um, so we also looked at kill site dynamics to see, and this was fed into by my theory about bears taking, taking their kills. So we would literally, as soon as the lion would make a kill, we'd go put trail cameras on it to see what scavengers came in. And we would get uh, eagles, we'd get bobcats, coyotes, magpies, other lions, skunks, you name it. We got it all. Next slide, please. And these guys. So through March and November, 41% of cougar kill sites were visited by bears. Wow. Um, 17 cases where they totally stole it, 18 potential that the lion just left the area and left, gave up the deer. Um, so, you know, whether that's driving some of the other things that we've already talked about, I don't know, but it, it, it makes sense. And you can see that bears can be a huge influence on predation rates, if nothing else, because they've got to kill more. Um, they're losing that energy. One more reason that females might key in on on urban areas to get away from the bears and eat smaller prey. So next time. We looked at, I'm gonna skip through this pretty quick, but we looked at diet with stable isotopes. So we can actually take blood samples, hair samples, bone samples, and look at what lions have been eating across time by looking at carbon and nitrogen signals next time. So you can see where our lions end up. Um, we want them down there by the ungulates, not up by the domestic animals, and certainly not out there by the cats and dogs. Um, but certainly some of those are taken. And we can pick that up because as, as you know, we eat a lot of sugars, we feed our pets a lot of sugars too. So that, that shows up in these stable isotopes. So we were actually able to look at historic samples too and see if there was a diet shift over time um, and see if maybe, um, like going back to historic samples from the 60s, if their diets were more focused on ungulates versus now, maybe more um, on some of these other alternative prey sources. Next slide, please. Um, how many lions are out there? That's what everybody wants to know, right? How many are there? We drive down the road and see hundreds of deer. How many lions are out there? Um, about Good estimates of lions, two and a half to three independent lions per hundred square kilometers. That's not a lot. If you think about the horse tooth area, how many lions might occupy that? There might be five that are using that area, those parks and areas beyond, just to kind of put that in perspective. So they're not, they don't exist at high densities. Um, it's also really hard to estimate densities. Nobody's really done a good job of that because historically we have to go in and capture them. And then we have to go capture them again and figure out the ratio of marked to unmarked to actually estimate this, which is kind of in my skill set. Um, but it's hard to do over a large area. You, now you've got a sample area, lions over these huge areas, and you don't know how much space they use. I'm just study here. It's a really hard thing to tackle. So. We put another grad student on this. And next slide, please. Oh, hang on with that video. I took some slides out. So um, we had some different ideas on how to do this non invasively because we've done some estimates on bear populations. Bear populations are super easy to do. You throw something stinky out in the woods, you surround it with barbed wire. Bears come in, they charge through it, they leave hair. We can do DNA analysis and identify the bears. So we can get kind of a mark recapture on bears. We can figure out how many roughly we're recapturing and do some statistics and get a bear density estimate. So that worked. Why not lions? So we went through the literature and realized that people have tried to lure lions in. And you throw baits out there, they don't come to them. You throw scents out there, they don't come to them. And somewhere in the back of my messed up head, I thought, if I could put a recording of Van Halen in the woods, these lions would come running to me. In a, in a um, so we didn't use Van Halen, but I really think curiosity killed the cat. I'm almost convinced of it. I've heard stories that, you know, we, as an agency, we tell people, if you see a lion, things to do, and it's made noise, right? And so I hear these stories of 
these people that see a lion like a hundred yards off, so they go out their back door banging pots and pans. <laughs> then they go back in their house. I scared that lion away. Thank God. <laughs> then they look out their window and the lion's in their yard. But with I think curiosity will kill the cat. So we didn't actually use Van Halen. We used a recording of a fawn in distress or a rabbit in distress. Yeah. And we play that all night long and we try to lure lions in. And when I started this, I also wanted to try to snag hair off of them so I could do a DNA sample. So go ahead with that video. So here we have this cubby built and we've got some barbed wire strung over it and a call playing in. And here comes my lion checking it out. Got to check out the camera. If anybody's used trail cameras, you'll know that animals check them out all the time. Elk come up to them. Bears are lethal on cameras. Oh, the lion goes back in. Oh, lion wants my call. We learned real quick that we had to tie these things down because lions will flat out run off with them. And they are no annoying. They're like 90 decibels of a screaming, screeching call. Yeah. Next slide. <laughs> so we thought we could estimate lion densities. So we did a study down there in the Boulder area because we have a collar, collared individuals as well. And we ran this camera grid. And in the first year, 2014, we got 86 pictures of lions. I also thought I'd do this on Bobcats as well. And we're going to ignore that part for now. The second year, I know this population didn't change at all, but we only got 42 pictures. Same cameras, same calls, same locations. I don't know why it dropped. The next year we got 118 pictures. Um, so that part worked really well. Hair samples. I see this lion going through this barbed wire, ducking under the, I know that barbed wire is running down its back. I could not find hair on that wire. They shed a lot too. So shedding doesn't help, it blows off. Um, their hair is just different. It's not like a bear charging through and getting just tufts ripped out. Then I went to genotype it and it was even worse because it's shedding hair. I need a rib to get the DNA. So I couldn't, that part didn't work. Next slide, please. Luckily, we had collars on a lot of these so I could switch methods and I could do a mark recite and analysis and get at this density. So not to get lost in the weeds. If I just estimated density of lions, there were 5.8 independent lions per 100 square kilometers that used this grid. But as you can see on this map with those yellow dots going out on the top, that the area they were using was bigger than my sampling grid, so I had to adjust for that. So if I adjusted, adjusted for that, we got an estimated density of 4.1 mountain lions per 100 square kilometers in the Boulder area. There's only one other recorded estimate, and that's in Montana. That's that's that high. Most of them are two to three. Um, so I would say there's a lot of lions in these urban areas. Next slide, please. Um, so just putting all the pieces together, um, cougar human interactions have increased as both cougar populations have increased and human populations have increased in the cougar habitat. Um, these exurban areas, these urban to wildland interface areas like we have around here, where we have all this open space, um, lion densities are high. And I think a lot of that has to do with their ability to utilize alternative food resources and that constant food source throughout the year. Um, we've got a lot of use of these alternative preys. Um, hunting in these areas are gonna have minimal impact on populations. Um, if we get high densities and think we need to reduce these densities, I don't think hunting is going to be the option in these areas because it's not really possible to hunt because of so much private property. Um, something I didn't mention, we did look at aversive conditioning, trying to see if we could slap the lion's hand and, and convince it that it didn't want to do certain behaviors, which as an agency, that's something we try because we don't want to have to put an animal down. Um, and it works on bears, right? If you got a bear hitting a, a dumpster, you just sit in your truck all night, the bear comes up and shoot it with a rubber buckshot. Or if you got a bear coming into somebody's house, you can put an, a, an electric doormat out 
and they step on that through a little shock and then they don't come back to the house. So things like that where the punishment is directly related to what they're doing is possible. But with a lion, what are we punishing? I mean, we can't catch them as they come into the city. What we do is we find them after they've come into the city and made a kill. So then if we catch them and do anything to them, what are they learning really? Um, they kill the deer, which is what they do in the woods, and, and that's not punished, so it's not killing deer. So I think all we've done there is taught them that people suck. And they should not like help. <laughs> which is a good message. I think that's a message Lion needs. Um, I still get phone calls from people that live down in the Boulder area in the foothills, and they're telling me stories about more and more People are shopping alongside the road with their cell phones taking pictures of lions right outside the road, and the, the lions don't seem to care. And then they're losing dogs and pets and things like that. Yeah, we need to be more responsible with our pets, but are we creating a bad situation by not harassing those lions a little bit? Um, I've actually recommended to some of those HOAs down there that maybe they hire, they get all the landowners on board and hire somebody to come through with their dogs and just run the lions. They don't have to kill them but just run them and, and reinstill that idea of it. People are bad. We should not lay alongside the road. We should avoid people at all costs. Uh, so next slide. What kind of dogs do they use? Big dogs. Actually not. Um, most, a lot of their dogs are little, little hounds, uh, red bones, blue ticks. They breed all kinds of different things into them. Um, and everybody's secretive. They've got Every, every houndsman's got the best dogs, and they won't tell you what's in, what all's been bred into their dogs. Super great dogs, though. Um, Some of the best know. photographs I have seen were done by a queen of ours up in Moffitt County. Yeah. He said he didn't hunt them, just take pictures. That's all he yeah. the dogs for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the dogs are amazing. They're super friendly. We'd run dogs all day long, and they're chasing lions, and we sit down eat your lunch and they're just like your house that we're coming up on, on some of your lunch, really friendly, um, great, great animals. Um, the houndsmen take a lot of pride in their dogs. And there's a lot of people now that they just like to go out for the chase and not uh, actually kill one. Um, I do think hunting is an important management tool that we need. Um, I don't know that it fixes everything, but I'd hate to see it disappear from our toolbox as managers to use it. Um, I've shot over 300 lions with my dark gun and climbed up a tree and got them out. I, I, I have no desire to hunt them, but um, at this stage, I just you kind of develop that relationship with that animal to be working on. Um, but uh, that's all I've got. Um, I'll leave you with this cool picture um, and take any questions that anybody might have. When did you see Two thousand six. Matt, I joined the division in two thousand six. Okay, I'll just ask you to repeat the questions yeah. and and also to pause occasionally and see if we have any on Zoom. Okay, perfect. So what's their potential with maintenance? Tell why they occasionally attack humans. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Say that again. Attacks of rare attacks on humans. Are they motivated by hunger, taste for humans, or is it more like territory? So the question was about attacks on humans. Um, it is very, very rare. Um, I don't know like, the exact number of fatalities in the history of this country on humans. It's around 40 or 50 in, in history. And then attacks are, are still, I think it's under 500 on recorded attacks on humans. But it does happen. Um, there's three recorded fatalities in the state, um, not necessarily confirmed. The, the one out of Idaho Springs that the book was written on, Beast in the Garden. Um, why that happens? Sometimes it's it's an animal that's got been it's diseased or um, you know that attack had a loved one a year or two ago that that lion I think had rabies. Um, so sometimes it's related to that. Um, in the wild, a lot of that's more an animal being startled. Um, you know, it's on a kill. You come around the corner. And, you know, does it go in the, uh, the fight or flight mode? Um, and, you know, it, it's, it just depends sometimes. Generally speaking, they're trying to avoid people. We had collars on lions 
across all the Boulder County and, and city open spaces. And I know those lions were day bedded all day long next to those trails and people are running up and down them even at night, you know, they're running up there at night and those lions generally are ignoring people. Um, so I think um, by and large lions are trying to get away from people and avoid that. And it's just those rare situations um, where they're startled, cornered or defending their young um, that those conflicts arise um, or a sub adult or, or something that is not in good condition and is getting desperate. Um, I've, I've done a lot of different things with lions and part of the study was looking at, at human interactions. So in the beginning of our study, if we got a call that a lion was acting aggressively, I would literally walk out there with my telemetry and approach the lion. Every one of them ran like that. Um, we would get calls to a lion in somebody's backyard and they would hunker down in the brush mm -hmm. and I could literally walk up to them, lift up the brush and shoot them with my dart gun because they thought that was the only cover they had and they thought they were safe. Um, lots of situations like that where I would sit on a kill and wait for them to come in and then dart them and they're always trying to get away. So um, I, I really think that fear of humans is, is pretty well instilled in lions. I will caveat that to say, not if they're shorter than say three and a half or four feet. Mm -hmm. um, I about that. So we had for a while, we had some lions in our wildlife health lab. They were orphaned when they were nine weeks old and raised by our vets up there. And our vet actually did target training and they were gonna look at CWD with them and see how they interacted with CWD. So she could walk in with them. She had them trained to do all this targeted stuff so they could see if CWD had an effect on them. I could walk out there and those lions could care less about me. When my kids were little, those lions locked on them like you wouldn't believe. Um, and those lions had been in captivity since they were nine years old. Um, so, that height, that that prey picture that they have um, is something to that equation. And I just don't think that humans, this tall, two-legged thing, doesn't quite fit in their in their prey picture response. Like the, the, the bigger cats. What's that? They're not only managers like the bigger cats, jaguars, <clears throat> Yeah, and I think even that's rare. Um, but yeah, um, I've never heard of a lion that's repeatedly doing that. There's some cases in California, but um, those are taken out really quick um, when they get those reports. So yeah, it's a rare occasion. Yeah. <clears throat> Does the uh, uh, deers that have uh, chronic racing type diseases, does that affect the lion populations? Do you see that in lion? So the question was whether the, um, the deer chronic wasting um, populations, a lot of chronic wasting, you know, does that affect the lions? Are you talking about in terms of can lions get chronic wasting disease? Yeah, do they get it? Or? So that was what we were doing um, with the lions at the health lab was actually feeding them a diet that consisted of a, um, a lot of positive CWD positive deer, and they no, never showed any signs of it. Um, so, you know, that. It hasn't been published yet, but I would say no, that doesn't affect it on that side of things. So. The uh, yeah, is there any story behind the picture? I love that picture, isn't that cool? Yeah, that's great. Lions like to fly. Anybody know how fast a lion is? How fast can a lion run? 45 miles an hour. They can't run very far though. And that's why we can chase them with hounds. Do you know why they can't run apart? Not their lungs. Heat. Just like the heat. Yep, it's all their nose. So the canids have this really long nose. So the blood going to the brain is running through their nose. So it's cooled off the air coming through their nose. Lions and cats have really short noses. So they overheat really fast. So they can run really fast, but not very far. You know how high they can jump? Yeah. At least that high. Yeah. Um, 
from 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 a standstill, 19 feet straight up. We used to use snares. Um, it's just a, a cable that would go around the front foot, and we'd catch them with a snare. And that was attached to a spring, and it's this big, big um, V-shaped spring that you. I mean, it, it takes all you can do to close the spring, and when it snaps open, it's really fast and really, really explosive. Um, and hurts when you are in the way of it. Um, I've got a picture of a lion because we put trail cameras on the set, and this lion was coming into our cubby and stepped on that spring, and I can see that lion, that lion jumped straight up in the air, and you can see the cable below its feet. That's how fast it was reacting and how quickly it could jump. And you should try it sometime. Just walk along and then try to jump straight up in the air. It's really hard and really slow. Um, so, and how far vertical or horizontally can you jump? 45 feet. Yeah, amazing animals. How did I get off on the tangent? What was the original question? <laughs> oh, the picture. Oh, gosh, I get so distracted so quickly. I think lions just like a jumper. Now, in the picture before this, there's a magpie. So a magpie was coming out on the kill, which is, is pretty common. And I think that lion was either bored or just got tired of, of the magpie being around and jumped at it. Yeah. But from laying on the ground to jumping that high and jumping that far, really amazing. One night I had a lion that was waking up on me because we have to reverse the drug. It was really cold and we caught her in the cage trap and we we're getting everything worked, worked up. And 100 pound female. And she started waking up, which is not that uncommon. And usually all I have to do is grab the back of her neck, scruff them, and pin them back to the ground and hold them there for a second. And they just go back to sleep. Well, this lion was not going back to sleep. She just stood back up. And I pushed her back to the ground. And I'm hollering at my crew to get the reversal drawn up so that we can reverse her and just let her go. Well, it was cold. <laughs> Our reversal was frozen solid. So I'm yelling at them, and they're sitting there rubbing the vial between their hands, trying to get it to melt, trying to get it to, so they could draw it. And all of a sudden, I just felt her muscles tighten, and she left. With me on her back, over 15 feet, we went down in a heap, and she was gone. And I'm laying there in the dirt. So they're they're pretty amazing. What they can do. Well, a house cat, what they can do. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think the interaction between the uh, cougars and the Bears, we introduced wolf bulls in Colorado. How does that interaction happen? Does that create more pressure than on the on the uh, cougars? It definitely could. There's some studies out of the Yellowstone. Uh, the question was how introducing wolves is going to impact the cougar populations and what they do. Um, certainly, I think wolves will displace uh, the lions a little bit. Um, some of the studies out of out of the Yellowstone have demonstrated that. Wolves will probably be preying more on, on elk than deer, um, so there might be some separation that way, but, but certainly it could impact their populations um, in terms of where they are and it could actually impact their numbers. I, I don't think there's a lot of data that say one way or another, but I would expect that. Um, and then how lions are using um, those prey populations in the winter when all of our prey move down, unfortunately, towards town, because you know that's where we build, that's where we want our ski areas and everything, and that happens to be winter range. And now they're going to go in there, and lions historically been using that, and the wolves use that. I don't know, um, you know, we'll see what happens. But definitely going to be some impacts. On Should we go, ahead? Andrew? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say we've got questions a in the chat window. We do have a couple questions. Uh, one of them did get answered already, which is about the uh, the lion jumping and what's going on in the picture. Um, also, lots of kudos coming through for you, Matt. So that's uh, a testament. And uh, the final question we have is, um, is your study publicly available? I believe they were talking about the study you referenced that hadn't been released quite yet, but um, feel free to clarify if I have that wrong. Um, I think the study I referenced that hadn't been released was the CWD one. Um, I don't think that is out yet. Um, I think it's in draft form. 
um, most of what's been done on the front range um, in the study that I talked about here has a lot of it has been published. Um, the population estimate study was published a few years ago. Um, there's another paper out that's been published on how lions are used in and interacting with humans. That one's been published. Uh, we also work with CSU on some disease stuff, and there's you know, a ton of papers um, published on lions and, and bobcats and house cats and disease dynamics and, and, and all of that. So there's been quite a few papers published on, on this project. Okay, yeah, and the, as a follow-up, they uh, ask, thinking of the front range study, um, where can we find this? Um, the easiest place may be on the Colorado Parks and Wildlife website. There should be a final report on there that kind of summarizes everything. Um, and then that should reference, you should be able to find um, the papers that we published on it as well. And there should be PDFs there, or at least a PDF of the abstract. Thanks, Matt. Um, if you wouldn't mind answering one more question here online. Um, sure. We have Susan curious about interactions with links. Good question. I always ask people at, at what elevation do a bobcats turn into links? <laughs> uh, 10,000, I guess. Um, no, that's an interesting question because generally speaking, we think that there might be some vertical separation between um, the lynx and the mountain lions and the bobcats, just because lynx are going to use those higher elevations, those alpine areas, and, and keeping it on the snowshoe hair. And they've got those big, big feet on a light, lightweight animal that keeps them above, above the snow so they can actually hunt in there. Um, so generally speaking, I'd say there's not a lot of interaction between lions and lynx. Um, because there is that segregation. But we will get lions up on the alpine in the summer, and they will hunt and make kills up there. Um, not so much in the winter, so I, I think there's a lot of segregation just due to snow depth. Um, but we are, we do, because we put so many trail cameras out in the woods, we do get mountain lions up where lynx are, we get bobcats up where lynx should be, and we get lynx down here where bobcats should be. So there's definitely some overlap. But I don't think there's really a negative interaction between the, the mountain lion and the lynx <coughs> populations. Yeah. Is there uh, at the CPW have a population management number for mountain lions in the state? Or? Um, so the question was if the Colorado Parks and Wildlife has a management number or a, a objective number for the population of the state. Um, that's, a, that's a tough question because there really haven't been good estimates of mountain lion densities. Um, and it's really, you know, with elk and deer, we can fly our surveys every year and get calf cow ratios and all kinds of other statistics, which are great. Um, how do you do with that with lions? I mean, we don't fly a lot of hours and not see many candidates. Um, so a lot of what, has been done historically for all states is taking the little bit of information that exists on habitat quality and densities that were observed associated with that habitat quality. And then you assess your habitat quality across the whole state, apply those numbers and get some number of lions that could potentially exist in the state. Um, so that's used to kind of get an idea of it. But then how we, manage lions it's we hunt our hunting is with a quota system so when the quotas reach it doesn't matter if you still have a tag you're, the quota is closed in that area and then we look at the characteristics of the harvest coming in in terms of number of females that are harvested number of males number of adults number of sub adults and based on how that harvest comes in and the selectivity of hunters if we see a lot of adult males, then we know that population is doing really well because most people are going to pass up the female and just run the male. When you start seeing the females come into the harvest, then we'll actually back off on the quota and in some cases actually close it if too many females are harvested. That's kind of what most states are doing with management. And now we, with the techniques that we've got here, we've actually got two survey areas going in the state trying to get numbers in parts of the state. 
but it's it's really time consuming and hard to do. So we're trying to do that, but also it's just through our statistics. To what extent do mountain lions eat uh, things other than mammals? Um, do they fish? Do they, they eat birds? There's some documentation of fish, but they're grazed orange. They'll actually, there's, you know, they will, they will smoke, they will eat birds. Um, so there are documentations of, of, you know, smaller birds. Turkeys are pretty common, you know, the bigger stuff. I, I think the smaller birds, a lot of times are, you know, a lion that's really hungry or situations like that where they've got a bird close to a kill or something and kill them there. Anything else? Hey John, we, we got a couple more on on Zoom. I'm not sure if if we have time for those though. Uh, we have time for two more questions. Great. Uh, I've got uh, most recently: Are lions as susceptible to the plague as cats are? Um, uh, like the bubonic plague. I would assume. I assume that. so. They are susceptible to it. Um, during the front range study from 2006 to 2016. Um, I never had a lion um, really die from any disease um, and none of them from the plague. Um, through some of the work we did at CSU, they were picking up some of the other like fever and FIV and some of those other felid diseases, um, but we didn't have any mortalities from that. Um, the current study we're doing down farther south, we've had two lions that dispersed one up by Not Glenwood, the other G that's off of I 70 before you get to the south. Georgetown. Yeah, it's first up by Georgetown. And that line actually did die from a uh, plague. And we've had one other line since then that died from the plague. So it certainly does happen. Great. And final question of the night from Polly Are there any results from the study on the impacts of removing lions and bears on mule deer fawn survival? Um, one of those studies has wrapped up and that is being published and the other study is ongoing so there's no results from that yet. Right. Thanks everybody. Just fantastic. Um, uh, before people sign off, I just want to make an announcement about next month's program. Um, 